Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for study from the months of April to June of 2013, a very interesting series entitled Major Lessons from Minor Prophets. And today we're studying the first part of the book of Zechariah, and our lesson is entitled Visions of Hope, Zechariah. It's number 11, lesson number 11, for June 15 of 2013. And in case you would like to look at these in advance, you might want some materials to use in your own Sabbath School class, you can find them on our website at Theox, that's www.theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So, I hope you have a Bible handy. We'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, it is such a privilege to have your word readily available to us. What a blessing in English, the English language to have literally a thousand different translations we could look at. But even in other languages, so many ways to study your word. And the ancient languages, which if we have opportunity, we can study them. Now as we look at these, uh, this material written some 2,500 years ago, may we understand exactly what you intended for us to understand is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Zechariah. Zechariah was a young man who apparently, as far as we can tell, uh, worked with his friend Haggai, which we talked about last week, in inspiring the children of Israel in the year 520 B.C. to restart their efforts to, to rebuild the temple. Remember, this is, this is about 14 years after they have come back from the Babylonian captivity, and when they first arrived after the Babylonian captivity, they apparently cleared off a space on Mount Moriah where Solomon's temple had formerly stood, and they set up a small altar, and there they began to offer sacrifices uh, according to directions using the Levites, etc. But every time they tried to do something more than that, it seems like they would get discouraged, or their enemies would come and harass them and get them to stop working. And 14 years have gone by, and suddenly Haggai and Zechariah are given messages by God that would inspire them to get together and they did a remarkable job. Um, within Haggai's whole book was three and a half months. And Zechariah was right there to pitch in. We're going to talk about what he had to say in a, little bit, in a little bit. But they were some of the most successful prophets in the Old Testament. Who uh, Can you name a couple of other very successful prophets in the Old Testament? Jeremiah. Why would you pick Jeremiah? Long book. La uh, la <laughs> I'm thinking about two books. I'm thinking about Jonah. prophets who had a Jonah. I mean, he preached for a few days and bang, he converted the whole city of Nineveh. At least it looks like it, doesn't it? That was pretty impressive. Uh, can you think of any others that had a pretty remarkable effect? Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and ne especially Nehemiah. And Nehemiah arrived from way over there in what we would call Iran today, traveled to Judah for the first time with authority from the king to rebuild the wall. In this case, it's the wall, not the temple. And how long did it take him under, uh, take them under Nehemiah's direction to rebuild the wall? 52 days, 52 days to finish the wall. Now, big pieces of the wall had already been done, but these were the finishing touches. They put that wall together and they put the gates together and they were protected from their enemies. 52 days, that's a pretty remarkable effect. So here we have Zechariah and his friend Haggai, who's quite a bit older. Uh, the two of them have had a remarkable impact on the children of Israel. Um, I'm not sure if I should mention this because it might scare some people, but uh, look at Zechariah, the um, first chapter, starting with the first couple of verses, actually just verse 1. In the eighth month of the second year that Darius was emperor of Persia, the Lord gave this message to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah and grandson of Iddo. Um, 
So he, he lives his life. There's no record of what happened to him at his death. Um, but when we get to the book of Matthew, he talks about a Zechariah who died between the porch and the altar. Remember that? And he said that Zechariah was a son of who? Berechiah. Does that mean this Zechariah died between the porch and the altar? Yep. Matthew was wrong. Matthew made a mistake what? under inspiration? How could that be? No, the Zechariah he was talking about was a Zechariah over at the end of Second Chronicles, which would have been, you know, ta he's talking about it in the context, Jesus is talking about it from the, from the first of the books, uh, Genesis to the last of the Old Testament in those days, which would be Second Chronicles, and he mentions Zechariah the son of Berechiah, but it was the wrong Zechariah. There's a mistake in the book of Matthew. So who made the mistake, Matthew or Jesus? I'm sure it was Matthew. <laughs> oh. I'm very sure it was Matthew who made the mistake. Anyway, just a little interesting little side note. There are, side note, there are these two Zechariahs that are fairly prominent in the Old Testament. But Zechariah here, the son of Berechiah and grandson of Iddo, there's some hints that Berechiah may have died fairly, fairly young because when you go back to Ezra and you read about the sequence of the priests, Zechariah was a priest, um, it goes from Iddo to Zechariah, implying that Berechiah, for whatever reason, must have disappeared from the picture. But those are just little trivia bits, and uh, we need to go back to our main lesson for today. Um, when they arrived back in Jerusalem, they found the city was in total rubble. rubble. It was just nothing but rubble, just piles of rock and so forth. Nobody wanted to live there. I mean, it was, it was a job just to clear the place out so you could try to build a home. Uh, but as we've mentioned, some 14 years later, Zechariah and, and uh, Haggai inspired the people to do something. And what happened first under Zechariah was a series of eight visions. And we're going to look at those visions in a, a sort of an unusual way. Let me give you this little introduction. The message of Zechariah's first six chapters is quite simple. It's time to rebuild the temple. This appeal was the main communication, between a, uh, communication behind a series of eight short visions that God gave to Zechariah. They were written in a chiastic order, like a mirror structure. So it's like a big V, and the, the word chi in Greek is a big X. So we're thinking about the top of that X. And this means that, that of these eight visions, four go down like this, and five, six, seven, eight go back up like this. So if you fold them together, eight and one go together, and uh, seven and two go together, and six and three go together, and four and five go together. So we're going to look at them that way and see what it was that Zechariah was trying to say. Is this, is this a, a literary uh, a quality? Uh, a literary device. I like there's different kinds of poems. Yes. So this is, this is, this is basically a literary uh, thing in their culture. That's correct. A literary device used in ancient times by quite a few people in the Bible, I might mention. Song of Solomon is organized like that. The Book of Revelation is organized like that. Uh, there are a number of chiasms in the short ones in, the, in uh, Psalms, for example. It's, uh, there's other places as well. Is, is there a reason for that? Is it just, this is the way we... Some people have suggested it makes it easier to memorize. Mm. And remember, when paper, I mean, they didn't, even, didn't even have paper like we have, but writing material of any kind was very difficult to get, to, to very expensive. Uh, a lot of people tried to memorize things, and maybe that made it easier to memorize. That's one possibility. So, when we said eight and one, barely, but there's another part to this picture. We in, in, in Western cultures, with a scientific bent to our thinking, we want to know what was the cause and that what was the result. Cause, result, cause, result, cause, result. That's the way we think. But the Jews didn't think like that in ancient times. They said, here's a result here. I can see that in front of my, in front of my face here, but what then was the cause? So they looked at result, cause. Result, cause, result, cause. And so we need to read these things just the opposite of the way we, we read them. So we're going to challenge you to follow us as we try that on these eight visions 
of Zechariah. And the first one, then we're going to pop all the way over to chapter 6, Zechariah 6, uh, the first eight verses, actually first five verses pretty much covers it, but, and I'm going to ask Norm to read uh, Zechariah 8, I'm sorry, Zechariah 6, six, the first few verses there. <clears throat> okay. And I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot, black horses, and in the third chariot, white horses, and in the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Okay, horses, ready to chariots, go out, and chariots and so forth. What would, what would that make people think of in, in Zechariah's day? War. That's a war scene. Okay. That's a war scene. Okay, now we're going to ask Gordon to read the matching uh, one in, in the, the first vision. That would be Zechariah 1, 7 to 11. In the second year that Darius was emperor, on the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of Shabbat, the Lord gave me a message in a vision at night. I saw someone riding a red horse. He had stopped among some myrtle trees in a valley, and by, behind him were other horses, red, mm -hmm. dappled, and white. I asked him, Sir, what do these horses mean? He answered, I will show you what they mean. The Lord sent them to go and inspect the earth. They reported to the angel, We have been all over the world and have found that the whole world lies helpless and subdued. Okay, helpless and subdued. That means nobody's fighting, there's no war. The war that uh, Norm mentioned to us apparently has stopped now, and that would mean, is this a good time to build a temple or not? Good time. Good time to build a temple. You know, you don't have to have your army out there fighting people. It's a great time to build a temple. Okay, now we go to uh, Jay. Could you read us what angel number seven or yeah, vision reading, number seven covers. Yeah, I'm reading uh, Zechariah 5. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, chapter 5, verses 5 through, through 11. Uh, the angel appeared again and said, Look, something else is coming. What is it? I asked. He replied, It is a basket, and it stands for the sin of the whole land. The basket had a lid made of lead. As I watched, the lid was raised. And there in the basket sat a woman. The angel said, This represents wickedness. Then he pushed her down into the basket and put the lid back down. I looked up and saw two women flying toward me with powerful wings like those of a stork. They picked up the basket and flew off with it. I asked the angel, Where are they taking it? He answered, To Babylon where they will build a temple for it. When the temple is finished, the basket will be placed there to be worshipped. Okay, now think about why, what we know about why the children of Israel went into Babylonian captivity. What were they doing? Remember Hosea? Remember my? We had all these fertility cult religions going on in all the hills, in places that said under er, at the top of every tree and under every shady tree here were these fertility cult things. So a wicked woman would represent one of these fertility, these fertility cult processes. And what happened to those fertility cult things? They were carried off to Babylon and God says, leave them over there, let them worship them over there if they want to. We're done with that kind of stuff. We're not going to do that here anymore, right? Okay, well, let's see what vision number two says. This is now Zechariah 1, verses 18 through 21. In another vision, I saw four ox horns. What do horns tend to represent in Kingdom. biblical prophecy? Kingdoms. Kingdoms, powers. I asked the angel that had been speaking to me, what do these horns mean? He answered, they stand for the world powers that had scattered, that have scattered the people of Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. 
Then the Lord showed me four workers with hammers. What are they going to do? Why have they come? He answered, they have come to terrify and overthrow the nations that completely crushed the land of Judah and scattered its people. So what's going to happen? We carried the wickedness of Israel all the way to Babylon. We're going to leave it there. And the people who have been harassing the children of Israel, surrounding them, what are we doing with those people? Crushing them and, you know, get, getting rid of their opposition so that once again we can do what? Worship, build, God. worship God and build our temple, right? Okay, now we have to go to number six, and that would be Yoli. That's uh, Zechariah 5, 1 to 4, I believe. Mm -hmm. I looked again, and there before me was a flying scroll. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. And he said to me, this is the curse that is going out over the world, over the whole land. For according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of anyone who swears falsely by my name. It will remain in the house and destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. Okay, so what this is a scroll and what seems to be written on the scroll? Watch. Judgments against wicked people. Watch out evil. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, and this is, a, this is an investigative kind of judgment, isn't it? And anybody who's been involved in evil, it's gonna, what's going to happen to them? Destroyed. Be destroyed. And What's then going to be the result? We have now number three, and that would be Myra. What's the, res what's the result of this cause? In another vision, I saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. Where are you going, I asked. To measure Jerusalem, he answered, to see how long and how wide it is. Then I saw the angel who had been speaking to me step forward, and another angel came to meet him. The first one said to the other, run and tell that young man with the measuring line that there is going to be so many people and so much livestock in Jerusalem that it will be too big to have walls. The Lord has promised that he himself will be a wall of fire around the city to protect it and that he will live there in all his glory. Wow. So whereas we had the flying scroll is going around measuring people and judging them, we now have someone who goes out as if they're going to measure and judge people, what, but what's, what's, what does the angel say to him? Don't bother. The, there's peace around and God is the ring of fire, the wall in effect, around all of Jerusalem. We don't need, we don't need judgment now. There's going to be peace. We're not going to be harassed by these other nations, right? So when did that happen? Okay, we're going to come to that. <laughs> Very good question. When did that happen? Yoli. Is it true that in the second one there were no wall, it was the Yushits? I read that the second temple, when it was built, some parts to separate, there were no walls. It was missing some wall. I'm not, I'm not aware of that. Could be. I don't remember having read anything like that. I read it. So, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves, and we're going to really focus on that when we get to the latter part of the book of Zechariah, when are all these things going to be going to happen? Really take place? That's one of the big questions. What did uh, What did Zechariah do with this vision? He wrote it down. Wrote obviously. it down. Mm -hmm. Was it probably uh, was preached this, it? Was this just information for him to encourage him, or did he read this? Did they read this in the temple, or did he, he was, tell the people, "Look, this is what the Lord has said, and this he is was, what's going to happen"? Here? He was one of an important line of priests. So presumably this message was, was spread to the people who came to the temple to worship. And the, and the people who, in this case, probably came to the temple to help build it. He's saying, don't hesitate to build. Here's what God says. Why did God use all of these symbols and illustrations and so on? Why couldn't he just kind of... That's you know, one of the use. huge questions we need to keep that question because we need to focus on it all the way through Zechariah. That's a huge question. Well, I mean, doesn't it seem like God should have just said, 
bang, 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 this is what I have to say, that's it, in plain, ordinary English? Well, first of all, he wasn't speaking English. Mm -hmm. He would have to do it in Hebrew, and we would still have the problem of translating it. But um, that's a good question. That's one of the ones we need to focus on. We need to come back to it several times in our study of, of this book, because it's particularly relevant in this book. Well, so now we need to go to uh, number five, and that would be Gary. And that would be Zechariah 4, and we'll ask you to read the first few verses of up to verse 6 of Zechariah 4. Okay. Then the angel who talked with me returned and waked in me as a man is wakened from his sleep. He asked me, What do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and one on, the, on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Note, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, wow. It's kind of comforting that Zechariah didn't quite understand what all this was about. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. Okay, well, we're going to come back to that because that's a really important, especially that last verse. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's a really important message here in the first part of Zechariah. We'll come back to that in a moment, but let's go now back to number four, which will be the last, the last of these eight. So it should be the final conclusion. By the way, another part of the chiasm thing, that big V thing, is to say that the kernel at the bottom is supposed to be the most important. So lesson number, uh, prophecy number five and number four, which we're going to read next, those two are the most important ones. So those are the ones we'll spend the most time focusing on. So Jim, I guess that's Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this hand a brand plucked from the fire? How, excuse me, now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich apparel. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with the garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. Uh, that angel of the Lord, is that another reference to Jesus? Well, that's a good question. The, the, the word angel that we use comes from a Greek word, angelos, and it means a messenger. So who would be the messenger Lord? This is the, probably the clearest, or one of the clearest anyway, messages in the entire Bible about how the judgment is actually carried out. Now, another very important place where that with judgment is talked about is Daniel 7, uh, 9, 10, and up to 13. But these are a couple of places, and, and so we're going to be focusing on what's going on in the judgment. That's one of the really important issues here. Was that the cause for what, Jerry, or what Gary read as the result? Reverse. No, it's the other way. I got it backwards? Yeah. It wouldn't make any difference. I didn't understand either way. <laughs> okay. Jesus, if this angel refers to a messenger of the Lord, and if G the one we call Jesus is the messenger of the Lord, but he is also the message. Mm -hmm. He's the only one who is the messenger, but also the message. Mm -hmm. How does this judgment message fit with olive trees and bowls and good, the like? Good, fair question. Let me just give a real quick kind of answer and then, because we're going to dig into those two messages particularly. The 
olive trees, the two olive trees feeding into the bowl and then feeding out to all the lights, probably meant to the original people, here's, now, where did, let's just think of some very practical points. Where did the olive oil come from? Olive. It came from the olive trees, and they would, of course, have to reap the olives and press it and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's from the source, and it's feeding into this bowl. And here's this fairly large bowl, and there's these little pipes that go to all these lights. So this would be a well-lighted place with all those lamps around, right? Feeding from this one bowl. Now, in the original context, the, the two olive trees probably represented uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel. They were the leaders of the people, and the idea was... God's blessing was flowing through their, through their following God's instructions to all the people to finish building the temple. That's probably what it meant to them. Would, those li would they have thought menorah when they yeah. talked about those lights? Yeah. Yes, it would look, seem very much like a menorah. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think if I had my choice, I would rather be Zechariah here than Jeremiah. Yes. Jeremiah... And Isaiah and others had had the job of preaching gloom and doom, and Zechariah here is preaching regeneration and mm -hmm. and things are going to get better. Here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now in Revelation it talks about the two witnesses being the olive trees. Okay, and so now let's think about that. So now we we as Christians have the revelation. By the way, we've already noticed and we'll mention again several times that. The, the book of Revelation quotes many times from the book of Zechariah. It quotes many times from Ezekiel, a few less times from Zechariah, a, a few less times from Daniel. But those are the three main books that the book of Revelation quotes from. And those are three of the most important books that the entire New Testament quotes from. Uh, Isaiah is probably the leading one. And of course, that would be mainly in, in Paul and in the Gospels. But these are the big books that are being quoted in the New Testament. So that's another important point for us to remember, I think. The interesting thing in Revelation, it says, I will send my, my two witnesses. Yeah. And these guys are dead. Yep. So right. here you got the two witnesses. They're well, the olive trees. Yeah. It says it's, they're the olive trees. So okay. what is he talking about? Okay, fair enough. I said in their day, in the original context, it yeah, probably meant these that. two people. But in our day, what would the oil pouring from a single source and spreading out to all the people, what would that represent? We, many places in the New Testament suggested that the, the oil, the oil uh, could be, all, you, in many cases it would be the olive oil to the Jews, represents the Holy Spirit, right? And how does the Holy Spirit come to all of us? How does it spread out to all of us in, in our day? The light of the world. The light of the world. And that light is? be very concrete like the ancient Hebrews? The Bible. It's the Bible. So that the two olive trees in the New Testament context would be the Old Testament and the New Testament feeding the light of God through the Holy Spirit out through the tubes which might be the angels to us. So the Bible would be our source of light pre pre presented to us and prepared for us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So here's a case where the local application probably was a little bit different for them than it would be for us later taking the bigger picture. Okay? What do you think is meant, just I'm going to pick a few texts now here and then we're going to focus really on uh, chapters 3 and 4. Uh, look at um, Zechariah 1 verse 3. Just back up to that for a moment. Now I say to you, return to me and I will return to you. What, how, how do we return to the Lord? Repentance and okay. obedience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And then God will do what? Turn to us. He comes back to us, right? Mm -hmm. he, he, it's, it's not that God has gone away. It's just that he now responds to us. He now can communicate with us if we've got our ears open, if we're listening, if we're yeah. returning to him. Right? Very good. Well, and another couple of verses. Look at... Uh, Chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. Another interesting little section. 
and I am very, this is God speaking, and I am very angry with the nations that enjoy quiet and peace. For while I was holding back my anger against my people, those nations made the sufferings of my people worse. So I have come back to Jerusalem to show mercy to the city. My temple will be restored and the city will be rebuilt. What's, what's implying by I was holding back my anger against my people? And those nations made the sufferings of my people worse. That means he was sticking with them. He was sticking with who? The Jews? He wasn't letting them go. He wasn't letting them go. He was sticking with them. Okay. What does that imply? He hadn't given up on them. If you had been one of the... Yeah, he hadn't given up on them. Very good. Very good. If you had been one of the Babylonians in the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem three times, you probably would have gone home and reported to your wife or your hubby if you were there, and you would have said, we went down there and what did we do? Trounced them. We trounced them. We wiped out that city. We left it in a, in a pile of rubble. And God basically was saying, I wanted to discipline my people, but you made it worse, right? So now I'm going to come back and I'm going to punish you because you, carried, you, you went way beyond what I asked you to do. So God used Babylon as his agent of discipline, mm -hmm. but the Babylonians did more than they were supposed to. And um, Leaving God's God temple to, in a pile of rubble would be more than they were supposed uh, to. And God had to punish Babylon then. Yes. Yeah. How would the Babylon, Babylonians know how far they were supposed to go? And that's a very good question. They, they went back. They went back. They went back. And every time they, they did a little more havoc. And I mean, and why did they have to go back three times? The Jews kept rebelling. So, I mean, I, we don't think we can blame the Babylonians completely. I think there are reasons why they went back doing what they did. But, uh, well, they were, they were rebelling even when God had told them not to rebel. They yeah, were to cooperate yeah, with yeah. all of that. Okay, so now let's come to the couple of visions we want to really focus on, and that's, first of all, Zechariah 3. Let me just look at those. We'll look at those verses. Let's all look at them together. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. Okay, the high priest Joshua. What does the high priest represent in Jewish parlance and in, in their thinking of those days? Connection to God. Okay, the high priest was supposed to do what? Especially, when was the, what day was the high priest particularly for, uh, uh, the day of uh, atonement. yeah, was featured? On the day of the atonement, the high priest did what? He went into the most holy place and supposedly, you know, picked up the, the sins of the people who had been gathered the whole year and carries them out and puts them on the head of the scapegoat, and they're carried off into the wilderness, right? So here's someone standing representing all the people of Israel. We don't know that this is the Day of Atonement, but at least he's representing the people and presumably all their sins. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. Now, first question, where is this scene taking place? The Day of Atonement takes place here during, before Christ came, okay. but afterward, it's the end, that's when everything goes back to pumpkins. Well, okay, <laughs> but we have here what appears to be Jesus on one side, Satan on the other side, and the people represented in the middle what are we talking about here? Final judgment. Judgment. Yeah. We, we think of it as being in heaven. This must be the final judgment. We don't, there was no day of atonement where that kind of stuff happened here on this earth. Is, is, do we know that that's ever happened here openly? I mean, they're talking to Joshua and they're, you know, taking the filthy clothes off of him and so forth. I mean, that's never happened literally, has it, here on this earth? No. No. Well, no. it does in a way in principle happen well, all the time. Okay. But yeah, you're right. There's no physical time mm -hmm. that, that has happened yet. But it, elaborate on what you meant there that it happens all of the time in principle. What do you what Well do you don't mean? you think that the the war that's happening right now is a is one that's constant, that is happening, that he, that he's fighting for you and, and Jesus is fighting for you and trying to get you to go one way or the other. 
That, that's kind of what I mean. Mm -hmm. Is that that's the war going on? That's the great controversy. But now we're here to the point we're almost like at the end of the great controversy, and and final judgments are being made. Wouldn't you say the great high priest, or the high priest, went in representing the people? Mm -hmm. Uh, are we talking about the same motif now in the, in the final one? That the people are not there no. physically, but they are, Only being, Joshua rep they are being represented. Mm -hmm. That's what we see here. We see Joshua. We know he was the high priest. Okay. What do we know about this Satan? Now, let's be honest. Many, many people, even scholar, Christian scholars today, don't believe that there's a being by the name of Satan that really exists. So, does he exist or doesn't he? And who, who are we talking about here? He exists, and he used to be the uh, angel next to God, Lucifer, which mm -hmm. means light bearer. Mm -hmm. He rebelled, and now he's Satan. Short so, version. So, you're saying this is a supernatural being who one, at one time lived in heaven became jealous for whatever reason of God and mounted a rebellion against God. Where would you read about that? Revelation, Revelation. 12. Revelation 12. Now we're going to jump way over and look at that for just a second. Go to Revelation 12 and verse 7. And I, just a quick question. Yeah. How is it when, we, when we're reading this passage in Zechariah here, we can interpret the term Satan um, quite literally, and referring to Satan. Yes. Where, but when we re read the term Joshua, mm -hmm. we, we don't interpret that literally. We, we, we make that a, a kind of no, a we, spiritual comparison. We, we, now, I don't know, maybe I'm misreading you, but we have a real Joshua here that's representing real sinners, and he's, in, his, in his case, he doesn't, at this point in time, doesn't have a whole, most holy place to go into because they haven't built one yet. But he's supposed to be representing the people, and he's standing between someone who's accusing him and someone else who's trying to defend him. Okay? And I'm telling you, now, why do we make Satan in this case, why do we believe Satan in this case is a real person? He's real the accuser being. of the brethren. He's the accuser of the building, but brethren, that's correct. But there's a very specific reason why, in this case, virtually all scholars say, this must be referring to a real person. It's a tricky little thing, but we need to understand it. This is one of only maybe three or four places in the Old Old Testament, because we're now talking Hebrew here, where there's a article, a specific article in front of the name, meaning this is a person. Job 1 and 2, the Satan. Another place. Or in mm -hmm. other words, a specific. The Satan. Instead when, of uh, now, when when you use this the term Satan without the, it could mean just adversary, opponent, something like that. That's what the word means. But now we're talking about the opponent, the 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 adversary of God, and um, pretty much everybody has to agree that at least Zechariah thought this was a real live being of some kind. And we were going to read over here in Revelation 12, verse 7, then war broke out in heaven. Now we're, we're, we're into the Greek, the end, of the, old, the end of the end of the New Testament, looking at Greek. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. By the way, what does the name Michael mean? Who is like God. It could be a question, who is like God, or it could be a statement, the one who is like God. Fought, so uh, fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated, and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, and here we have the Greek explanation, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. So once again, when talking about these great controversy kinds of things, it nails it. It doesn't, it doesn't leave us guessing who, this, who the great dragon is. It says just very specifically, doesn't it? Then why is there the confusion? You talked about scholars who don't believe in such a in such a creature. Where do they go to defend their idea? There's several in issues involved in that, and we don't have to get time to get into big long theological discussion. But there's several things that make that possible. One, 
they don't believe that God, even God himself, has the power to predict the future. They think that would eliminate God, man's freedom. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about these, these time periods, great long time periods, and Satan is fighting against Christ, and something else happens like this, like, oh no, he says, that, that can't be real, because that's long time periods. It must have been something going on in, in maybe John's day in the book of Revelation. Maybe it was something about Nero or something else like that. That's the first part of the problem. There's yeah. a few verses in, in 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. uh, 2. Mm -hmm. and let, me, let me read okay. those because it, it's relatively quick. Uh, Paul speaking. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing scriptural things with scriptural. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Mm -hmm. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah. Is, is this the bottom underlying mechanism that creates this kind of division? I certainly think so. I certainly think so. So we, we need to keep moving. We've got a lot of material we still want to talk about. So what happens in Zechariah 3? Basically, who's accusing Joshua? The adversary, Satan. The adversary, yeah, Satan. Satan. Who's defending him? Jesus. Jesus, basically, okay? This is very important because many people think that the one who's accusing the saints is whom? God. God, the, the Father, who's the stern the judge, <laughs> the stern judge up there, and he's looking for any excuse to keep us out of the kingdom. That's not the accuser. The accuser is Satan. He's the one who's trying to get people to give up, to get discouraged, to stop, and so forth. And if you look through the Bible, through many, many verses, Revelation 12 we mentioned, 1 John 2, Romans 8, Job 1 and 2, John 5, many verses I could mention. Uh, we, we see in Daniel 7, I mentioned earlier, there are many rep references in the scripture to judgment. But there are very different ideas about when and where it takes place. Now here's the, here's the challenge, and you asked about the challenge. Here's another huge challenge. The judgment must take place before the rewards are given out. Absolutely. Clearly, right? I mean, everybody would recognize that. Yeah. And most people's eyes, most Christians' eyes, that means that the rewards must be eternal life, right? If it is true that people go immediately to their eternal reward at the time of death, and if it is also true that the soul is immortal so you can't really die, then the judgment, whatever that means, must happen for each individual at or before the point of that person's death, right? I mean, if he's going to go to heaven or hell at the point he dies, someone's going to have to make that decision either at the point it happens or just before he actually dies, right? On the other hand, if it is true that the soul or person is mortal and a person sleeps in the grave, as suggested by Jesus and Paul, and let's just uh, look at a couple of verses on that one real quick here. If I can get my computer to behave itself. Um, John 11, 11 to 15 is one of the important passages. Jesus said this, he's speaking to his disciples about Lazarus who's already, who's just recently died. Jesus said this and then added, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and wake him up. The disciples answered, if he's asleep, Lord, he will get well. Jesus meant that Lazarus had died, but they thought he meant natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But for your sake, I'm glad that I'm not with them, so that you will believe. Let us go to him. So Jesus called death what? Sleep. Asleep. No question about that. And we don't have time to read it now, but in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, Paul talks about Jesus coming down and awakening those who are asleep in the graves. Okay? So let's just look at some conclusions. Again, we don't have time to do a lot of discussion here. And if you want to get this material with all the references, etc., once again, you can go to our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, to find this material. Here's what I summarized from all these verses 
in about the judgment. One, someday all of us, every single human being will be judged by God. There's lots of references for that. Two, God's judgment against the wicked is carried out with what the Bible describes as fire and the sword. Uh, Isaiah 66 and Jeremiah 25 and Hebrews 10 and so forth. Deadly either way. Deadly. When the righteous are judged, they will inherit the kingdom of God. So we've got the righteous entering the kingdom of God and we have the, rich, the wicked doing what? Dying. Um, then we have the dead, both righteous and wicked, rising from their graves to be judged. John 5, 28 to 30 talks about that and Hebrews 9, 27 does. Clearly, the righteous are going to be resurrected at what time? According to our understanding? Beginning of the... At the second coming of Jesus, the wicked will be resurrected what time? At his third coming. At the third coming, to see the final elimination of sin and sinners. And both the New Testament and the Old Testament, the judgment has been spoken of as still being future. And where do we see that? One of the examples is, uh, well, Jesus talks about it, Peter talks about it, Matthew talks about it, etc. And here's an example. Number seven, apparently Sodom, Tyre, Sidon, the men of Nineveh, and the queen of, Sheba, queen of the south had not been judged yet at the time of Jesus. He says they will be judged, Matthew 12, 42. Let's just look at that for a second. On judgment day, the queen of Sheba will stand up and accuse you because she traveled all the way from her country to listen to King Solomon's wise teaching, and I assure, that there is some, assure you that there is something here greater than than Solomon. Of course, who, who was he talking about? Talking about himself, right? And if we went back, we would read the Luke eleven thirty one. These people, these wicked, these different people from the past are going to rise up and say, you people had all of this information, you had Jesus among you, and you didn't respond? I mean, we responded with just a relatively little amount of information. Then eight, Satan is the one who accuses, and we've already read that in Zechariah 3, and we can read it in Revelation 12, and there's a lot of other places. Nine, the dead are waiting to be judged. If all this is true, surely they cannot be already in heaven or hell, since being at either would suggest that they had already been judged. And there's places that suggest that they're waiting. 1 Peter 4, 17, 2 Peter 2, 4, 9, and so forth. John 11, 2 Peter 2. Um, then 10, the angels who are sin, who sin, that would be which angels? The wicked angels. The wicked angels, the one who followed Satan, right? Are also awaiting their judgment, 2 Peter 2, verse 4. It's especially important to notice that it is not the one sometimes pictured as the harsh judge father who is accusing us. Once again, who is the accuser? Zechariah 3 makes it very clear that the one who accuses is Satan. And Revelation 9, he's called the accuser of the brothers and sisters, right? Which raises the next question. Why does God conduct his business in the open like this, telling everybody about it? I mean, why doesn't God just quietly go about his business, get the job done, and get on with it? Why these big, lengthy, you know, Let's review all the cases. Let's look at everybody's record, da-da-da. And that must, that must be a lot of time for God to do all of that. Well, how can he do any, it? Well, he doesn't want anybody to have any questions. You mean there's other people standing around watching? Well, I don't know whether it's other people or other universes. Well, let's read about that. Look at Daniel 7, starting with verse 9. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever, who would that be? Jesus. That would have to be God, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Jesus, Father, well, whoever, sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of individuals or people, maybe angels, there to serve him and millions of people st stood before him. The court began a session and the books were opened. When and where could we have a scene where God is seated on his throne and there's literally millions and millions of people watching him doing the judgment? After the second coming. After the second coming? Could it happen before the second coming? 
but not humans. Well, okay. Now, my version says people. Uh, try one of the other versions. They don't all say people. Um, see, it doesn't. It doesn't sell what they are. Look at verse ten in the good in the New American Standard Bible. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from it. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads, that's 100,000, were standing before him. And doesn't say what kind of beings these are. But wouldn't this have to take place before the second coming? Well, certainly the initial judgment would have to take place before the second coming, because what's going to happen with the righteous at the second coming? They go to heaven. They go to heaven. So if this is someone standing before the throne of God, and someone has a lot of the right, all the righteous have to be judged before the second coming. This must be, ha at least part of this must be happening before the second right. coming. Yeah. Right? So this would be God's judgment scene. But the reality, if you're talking about a, a judgment where it, where it takes place uh, physically, then that would be at the second coming when, mm -hmm. when wicked are killed and righteous are taken. So now, the primary purpose of the great controversy is to answer the questions and accusations that Satan has raised against God, right? And those answers must be given so decisively and convincingly that sin will never rise again. God did not just eliminate the opposition as he easily could have. I mean, Ellen White suggests he could have destroyed Satan as easily as you can toss a pebble to the ground. Desire of Ages 759, first paragraph. Nor does he try to solve the problem by exercising a sovereign right and his authority and just saying, I have decided, that's it, no questions raised. God doesn't do things that way. God wants to make sure that when the great controversy is all over, every single being in the entire universe, righteous and wicked, and we haven't talked about when the wicked will, this will happen with the wicked yet, but Everybody will know that God did everything he possibly could to save as many people as possible. That's the purpose of God's judgment. And it's done absolutely open. Now, on the other side, on Satan's side, does he operate transparently with everything wide open? How does Satan operate? Isn't he known as the father of lies, lies the deceiver, the opponent, the adversary? He's doing, trying to keep, thing, keep his reality, the truth about him, as quiet as possible. Okay? Well? You said earlier mm -hmm. that the whole point was to answer these questions. Yeah. There's an interesting quote in Prophets and Kings, mm -hmm. 696. Every act of his life, every word spoken, every miracle wrought, was to make known to fallen humanity the infinite love of God. Absolutely. He had been, cho he had been charged to be arbitrary, vindictive. That was to be changed. And when God looks at his judgment, very good point, when God carries out his judgment, does he say, well, there's one sin that's not forgiven, bang, you're lost. Is that the way he does it? No. Ellen White says, Steps to Christ, page 57, paragraph 2, the characters, and this is talking about the judgment, the character is revealed not by occasional good deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and acts. Are we making progress toward the kingdom of God, or are we going further and further away? That's the question. And God can judge that not just on the basis of a few you know, guesses, sort of. He knows every thought, he knows every action, he knows every detail of our lives, and he knows for sure what's the answer to that. We well, just got a couple minutes left, but in talking about Zechariah 4, verse 6, remember, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, how does the spirit act? Like the still small voice speaking to Elijah on. Yeah. Exactly. There was wind, earthquake, and power there, and, and fire there before Elijah, and God, and God appeared in this tiny little whisper of a voice. So here in Zechariah, you know, what, the way this is usually interpreted by people is, it's not by God's might and power, but it's by, I mean, not by human might and power, it's by God's might and power. Just give us that power, God, come out and, and give us the Holy Spirit so we can do miracles and we'll convince the world. 
Is that the way God works? But we are dependent on His power. Oh yeah. To even but come to Him for any change that takes place in us, it has to be by His power. But our choice, but His power. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and no argument about that. Uh, the Holy, how does the Holy Spirit work? He does four things really quickly. He keeps us alive. He woos us. He, he tries to draw us toward God. Three, he, he, he converts people. He convicts them until they decide, yes, I want to be a Christian. And finally, when they have become a Christians, God says, I will give you spiritual gifts so that you can help to grow mm -hmm. the, the, the church, basically. So those are the four things that the Holy Spirit does. It's not by some m remarkable miracle or something like that. It's by quietly working in people's minds and their hearts to convince them of the truth. But now, no, go ahead. Aren't times when God has to scream at people and really to catch their attentions? And that's one of the points we want to make. God has done that numerous times in the Bible. And how well has it worked? <laughs> it never lasts more than a short time. God knew from the very beginning that making splashy displays, I mean, the flood. I mean, how more impressive an action can you get than that? And what's the very next thing we read in the, in, in, in the story after, after Noah? Tower of Babel. They're building the Tower of Babel. <clears throat> Did the flood convince them never to sin again? No aphorism. You no way. Intimidate and persuade at the same time. Yeah. Yep. People still laugh at Noah today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people are not convinced to be Christians by mighty works of power. They're convinced by the quiet actions of the Holy Spirit as they think, as they, as they agree to God's plan, God's Holy Spirit and the angels working in their minds in the great controversy context. So that's why we say the main work of the Holy Spirit in our day is through the Bible. The, as we mentioned earlier, the Old Testament and the New Testament as we have it. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He inspired the prophets of the Old Testament. He inspired the apostles of the New Testament. This is the way the Holy Spirit works. Quietly, you can close up the book and set it on the shelf and leave it there for the rest of your life. Or you can open up, you can study it, you can be moved by the Spirit, and you can be convinced, yes, I believe that, I like what I read, I want to be more like God, and we can choose to be on His side. Otherwise, we will end up being on Satan's side, on the wrong side. See you next week.